You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd and Paul. I'm Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And he's here right next to me. <laughs> I am. <laughs> we brought you miles and miles yeah. across the ocean. Yeah, four and a half thousand miles, I think, to, to be here. Yeah. Yeah. And now that you're here yeah. in my town, Dayton, Tennessee, mm-hmm. we do have one point of rather important national yeah. notoriety and significance, and that is the Scopes trial. Right. You might know it as the Scopes monkey trial. Mm-hmm. And I can't bring a foreigner <laughs> to our land without dragging you around and showing you all of the uh, all of the sights and sounds. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of cool because you're here during the annual Scopes trial. Yes. Uh, play and festivities. Yeah, Every that's great. Every year on the anniversary of the Scopes trial, mm-hmm. uh, the town puts on uh, a play and we have various uh, activities that go on along with that. Mm-hmm. So I thought we'd I take you around, show you some of the sites. You may find them a bit uh, unfamiliar and confusing. That's okay. Uh, I'll try to educate you as we go. And then we're going to talk to a local historian. Yep. Uh, and have good. his insights on what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're going to go see, well, we're going to go see, we're sitting on a dress rehearsal mm-hmm. uh, of the of the play Mm -hmm. and then we're going to go ahead and see the full production on opening night yeah sounds great yeah should be great all right we'll have fun let's go check it out yeah let's do that so i took paul around the town showing him the sites related to the scopes trial honestly this seemed more confusing than anything else so we headed off to the historic ray county courthouse to meet my friend tom davis for a little history lesson all right well paul here we are it will. In the basement of the historic Gray County Courthouse. I've drug you around town showing you things. And this is my friend Tom Davis. Hello, Tom. Are you saying I live here at the museum? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Tom. He's kind of a museum. <laughs> <laughs> music. Good Tom to be with you. Is, uh, you are now with the Ray Heritage Foundation. Right. Ray County Heritage. Foundation. Ray Heritage Preservation Foundation. There you go. Mm-hmm. I knew it was um, and uh, you are in the, that organization is responsible for the annual scopes trial and play and festivities right see whole yeah so every year we they put on a play here in the courthouse pulled in that's in some sense reenacts the events of the the scopes trial uh hundred years ago almost now. So I thought, being as how he is a knowledgeable individual about the Scopes trial. <laughs> oh, pressure's on. <laughs> yeah, pressure is on. Uh, that he would know a lot more about the details of this than I would. So, uh, and certainly more than I know. Well, uh, that, that's the idea. Yeah. We're going to go to the, we're going to go to the local expert here to tell us yeah, what the deal is. So yeah, ask him your questions. Yeah, so Todd has been sort of taking me around town and showing me the various sites, places that are associated with what happened here back in July 1925. And uh, my main exposure, I guess, to the Scopes trial is the movie Inherit the Wind. Wash your mouth out with With salt. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we we don't put it on. And and so... Basically, I just wanted to ask you about that movie, because so many people get their history from the movies, right? Right. So how closely does that movie reflect what actually happened here almost 100 years ago? How much of it is fiction? Most of it is fiction (laughs) because Lawrence and Lee, the playwrights, were looking to comment on... Joe, Senator Joe McCarthy and his anti-communist activities right. in the 50s. And obviously they couldn't comment on something like that without risking blacklisting and all that happened to so many. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they chose another play, another situation, much like Arthur Miller did with The Crucible. Mm. Uh, that was another parable about the uh, sure. about Joe McCarthy. But... 
this uh, inherit wanted to comment on some of the themes that in in some respects were common to uh, the Scopes trial to uh, Salem Witch trial, other events, and then McCarthy's you believe it my way or else <laughs> approach. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of scenes were invented then for dramatic effect that didn't really happen. I mean, I can, you know, there, there were scenes where the, the protagonist, John Scopes, who we're going to talk about, gets arrested and it's all very dramatic because they kind of burst into his classroom and arrest him <laughs> there in the classroom. So you're saying some of these are... Uh, mo most of those didn't happen. Right, okay. <laughs> was Sco Scopes was... <laughs> technically, he was arrested. Uh, uh, served papers. Yeah. Uh, never went to jail. Uh, you know, this happened after the school year was over. Right. So... Uh, yeah. yeah. They dragged him off the tennis court to... Right. <laughs> <laughs> instead of out at the classroom. Actually... Yeah. They see... Uh, they sent a kid to go. Fight. No, no, it was one of the men that was helping plan the okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. plan the event. Right, was, sent him about four blocks down from the drugstore, <laughs> and you know I've always wanted to uh, picture John's playing tennis with three of his students. A gentleman walks up and says, "You know, Professor Scopes, the chairman of the school board, and the superintendent want to see you." Well, he hasn't been rehired for next year yet. You know, what's going through his mind? <laughs> Goes down and minds out. Right. <laughs> so we should probably begin to set some of the historical context of what really happened here then. Um, it's called the trial of the century. It yes. is for, for yes. good reasons, I, th I think, because it was a big event, as, well, it was a big event. But, as we're going to find out. But... So, yeah, set, set some of that context in the 1920s. Sure. Going, the, the, the roaring 20s, yeah, you have um, the, the, the early 20s, you have the appearance of a book by, by that guy right back there. That's um, mm -hmm. the great commoner, William Jennings Bryan. Mm -hmm. um, and Bryan was the Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, and he was adamant that he could find a peaceful solution um, it's a great war at first world war and failed mm. and watch the horrific acts of war and um, became convinced that it was um, mm. evolution and Darwinism that was responsible for yes. responsible for what happened there that that everybody was sort of thinking survival of the fittest and I want my nation to be the fittest so we're going to wipe everybody out and that leads to the misery of the whole one so he writes this book to sort of attack well, these ideas of human evolution he was mostly concerned with human evolution that's mm -hmm. really important point he did not care about plants and animals they could come by evolution and he didn't care but it was the human evolution issue and mm -hmm. he had the big the big problem mm -hmm. and this sparked this and he was well no he didn't Right. He'd run for president three times. Three times. Right. Yeah. So he's prominent. Yes. As well, yeah. yes, very prominent. And so uh, it's picked up mm. by lots of people across the country, and they decide we need, we need to make a law. There ought to be a law. That's okay. how things go. And so, yeah, so the Tennessee legislature, so help me out. Hmm. These details here. The Tennessee legislature passes what's known as the Butler Act. Right. Yeah. Oh, in that was March. Right? Yeah, passed it in March. Uh, John Butler, a representative, introduced the bill in January, debated it a little bit in March. By March, it had passed the House and the Senate and mm -hmm. went to Governor P. And Governor P was not terribly excited about signing it. Nobody said, don't do it. So he signed it and said, well, uh, the legislature's had its say. That's the last we're going to hear about this. Mm -hmm. Oops. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so what was in the Butler Act? The, yeah. the Butler Act basically says, basically made it unlawful for any public school mm. to teach that human beings were descended from a lower order of animals. 
contrary to the account in the Bible. So uh, it set a fine of between one hundred and five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. No jail time. You know, no other restrictions or uh, penalties. And they basically had their say. And figured everybody basically figured that this is the last we're going to hear about it. We won't. Right. We won't ever enforce this. Right. Because nobody was teaching it per se. Right. right. At that point. Yeah. So there, w there was this textbook, um, a civic biology. Was that a state mandated text? Did it was state approved. State approved. I, I believe there were several biology textbooks or science textbooks that the state had authorized. And for whatever reason, uh, Ray County chose to use mm -hmm. Hunter's uh, biology. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, the contract for using the book had run out the year before, mm -hmm. but instead of buying new books, well, we just won't buy one this year. But it's so expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're buying something. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. So they kept yeah. that on for another year. Yeah. It's a curious, it's a curious thing that it always struck me is that the Butler Act is so narrow and specific. Mm. You could you could almost teach the entirety of Origin of Species mm. because Darwin hardly mentions human evolution in that book at all. Right. Kind of how and and in the textbook even there's not that much mm -hmm. about human evolution. Now he um, Hunter has rather dicey paragraph or two. Yes. But uh, yeah. You know, that's that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you're right. I mean, I think it's like two pages where evolution is mentioned. But, and then there's some racist stuff. Yeah, right. About the origin of racism. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But it's pretty dubious whether it actually by like, well, we're at technically. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So a really strange circumstance. Mm. Uh, the, the law gets passed. What happens next? Yeah. Yeah. The law gets passed. <clears throat> the American Civil Liberties Union hears about it, mm -hmm. thinks about it, and says, you know, this is something that violates academic freedom, teachers, uh, freedom, of, freedom of speech. Uh, we ought to oppose this. They were looking for publicity because they were, uh, they were five years old at this point, and wanting to make a name for themselves as a defender of civil rights. Mm -hmm. So on May 4th, um, Chattanooga Daily Times and others in the state, other newspapers in the state, uh, published a news release saying, hey, Tennessee's passed this law. We're looking for a teacher who's willing to challenge it. Uh, we think we can do it without uh, the teacher's job being in danger and you know, we'll cover the cost, all this right. good stuff. So Dayton was in a really bad economic situation at this point. Mm. The coal mine, uh, coal mine iron ore processing uh, facility had gone bankrupt 12 years before this. Uh, employment had gone from, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,400 to maybe as many as a couple of dozen. Mm. Uh, in, in 1925. So the mining officials were looking, you know, well, let's get some investors so we can go on and keep working. The town was looking for jobs for people. Oh, the manager of the, now it was uh, Cumberland Coal and Iron Company, mm -hmm. uh, saw this and contacted the chairman of the school board who happened to be the man who had this table in his yeah, shop. Yeah, it's this table, right? Yeah. Um, and the and this chair that yeah. that's right, were. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, said um, my recreation of the conversation is, you know, hey F E, did you see the paper? <laughs> no, what you mean? Well, ACLU's looking for a test case. Maybe we could do it. Well, Robinson was a promoter. Right. And he he saw the benefits. So they got together a group of mm -hmm. town leaders, uh, offered to have the biology teacher at Ray Central High School uh, violate the law yes. 
a week after school's out, but you know, <laughs> minor detail. Oh, uh, and he's a logical choice. He's yeah, a logical teacher. Yeah, but he was also the principal, also a local man that probably saw something in this that he wasn't sure he wanted to get involved with. He was a fan. He was a family man. And he said no. Mm-hmm. So they said, hey, what do we do? Well, you're going to go for a science teacher, right? Right. And the likely candidate was this new kid, mm-hmm. John Scopes, just finished his first year of teaching, uh, math, chemistry, and general science. Mm-hmm. Well, he was playing tennis that day with some of his students about three or four blocks away from the drugstore. So they sent a man down to invite him to the conversation. Yeah. He came down and was offered this. Yeah. He said, well, if you can prove that I taught it, I'll do it. (laughs) Okay. Because his recollection was he couldn't remember having taught this. Right. Now, this is where we get into the weeds that are pretty interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because this conversation is happening a week after school. Scopes had been substituting for uh, Mr. Ferguson in the, sci- in the biology class the last two weeks, which would have fit. But he seemed to remember that the day I was supposed to cover the chapter on evolution... I was working on football plays for next fall. <laughs> now, the students remember that he did talk about evolution in other classes that he taught, but in the one in question, eh, perhaps. So the, the reaction was, we'll work around that. We'll Let, let's that. let's we'll do that. Do that. <laughs> right. So, uh, Rappelier, the Cumberland Coal and Iron manager, uh, fired off a a tech, uh, not a text, a telegraph. Telegraph. Yeah. Well, I know it started with a T. <laughs> well, to, let's old in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, we would fired, just text them. Yeah, yeah. fired off a telegram to the ACLU, said, we've got your man, you know, yeah. what do you want? Robinson fired off news releases to Tennessee right. newspapers and yeah. got going. So, so it's almost this kind of perfect storm, isn't it, where you've, where you've got this act um, that's been passed because people are concerned about the teaching of human evolution, and then you've got the ACLU with their concerns about academic freedom, and you've got the townspeople who are thinking, Here, here's a chance for some tourism and you know, so it's some publicity yeah. for the town, and you know, we're, we're in this kind of depression, and it could bring some money into the town. And so, uh, and so, what happens next? Uh, what happens with uh, John Scopes? Well, actually, John Scopes went home to Paducah, Kentucky, for a few days, and mm-hmm. uh, eventually, uh, a local attorney, mm-hmm. uh, John Arneal, volunteered to be his defense attorney. Uh, a reporter in Memphis asked William Jennings Bryan if he might be interested in helping prosecute. Uh, Brian said he would. Brian felt a little, in some respects, responsible for the law because of his uh, speech in Nashville the year before. Um, I think it was in his image, uh, basically the uh, speech that yes. birthed uh, that, that book. Uh, so he... He was contacted by another lawyer here uh, and agreed to come. When he agreed to prosecute, uh, the journalist H.L. Mencken Mm -hmm. ran into Clarence Darrow and said, look, Scopes is going to be prosecuted by Brian. Here's your chance to make a fool out of Brian. You need to defend the Scopes. Darrow... uh, volunteered his services and Darrow was famous by this yeah I was gonna well, say tell us about who he is Clarence Darrow was probably you know is, is probably in the top five mm-hmm. criminal defense attorneys America has ever seen mm-hmm. of known as the champion of the underdog one of his biographies is titled attorney for the damned mm-hmm. uh, he was a labor lawyer uh, the year before uh, if he had slipped from prominence, the Leopold and Loeb case 
brought him back into national headlines because he defended two college students who had killed a young man to see if they could get away with it, see what it was like to kill somebody. And, you know, they, they had studied Nietzsche in, in college and they were counting themselves as supermen. So the laws didn't apply to them. Mm. Well, Darrow was a, about, can I say, a devout opponent of the death penalty. Mm. And he successfully argued that society and the boys' education uh, were responsible for their actions. And instead of being uh, condemned to death, they were sentenced to life in prison. Mm. So that had really stirred up Brian's thoughts mm -hmm. about Bri about Darrow, all, yeah. all of these arguments. Yeah. Mm. And so Brian and Darrow, I mean, I mean, if they the win for the street, you have those two heads. I mean, the best teams around that you're going together. Yeah. And yeah. That's not too far from reality. Yeah. yeah. Not too far from, yeah. At least that. <laughs> that, 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 <laughs> that yeah, because there, there were no two more famous men in America right. than those. So uh, uh, Michael Kazin in his uh, biography of Brian that says, with Brian on the speaking mm -hmm. platform, Bill, uh, that was worth 40 acres of Fords. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I could. Yeah. yeah. So you, you have those two uh, coming to do battle. Yeah. Uh, in little old date. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's almost destined, isn't it, to be this grand sort of showdown between these two very prominent uh, right. people. Uh, and, yeah, you can see why it turned out to be this enormous sort of publicity draw that it turned out to be. Right. Well, you had two very famous men yeah. arguing issues that were very much in the public eye. I mean, right. creation, evolution... Let's broaden that and call it modernism versus fundamentalism or traditional Christianity. Newspapers were writing about sermons that pastors were, were preaching. Mm -hmm. So that, but then you get into things like, you know, the academic freedom. What does a teacher have the right to teach? Yeah. Okay. Well, as a taxpayer, what do I have to say about how my schools operate? Mm -hmm. I'll majority and minority rights if the majority you know we call ourselves a democracy yeah. democracy means the winner wins yeah. the loser loses mm -hmm. well if the majority says i want this mm -hmm. the minority has to go along with it doesn't it mm -hmm. well except what if the minority really doesn't want to go along with it or it mm -hmm. violates rights but the, don't they have some rights so yeah you now there's just all manner of so issues, yeah. So that brings us to the trial itself, which took place in the blistering heat of July 1925. So, so tell us about that. Tell us what happened at the trial. Well, it was hot, and we had a <laughs> lot of people in in the courtroom. Yeah, I'll estimate seven to eight hundred people. Wow. Oh, they spent the first couple of days re-indicting scopes, mm -hmm. legal oversight, mm -hmm. remedied, uh, picking a jury, and then they started arguing about what are we going to argue about? Yeah, uh, literally. Literally. Yeah. And the jury yeah. sent out. Right. right. Yeah. They missed most of the trial. <laughs> yeah, the jury estimates, estimates I've seen, they were in the courtroom for about two, two and a half hours over eight days. Really? Yes. Wow. The rest <laughs> was legal arguments. Okay. Okay. Uh, First was, can we argue constitutionality of the law? Because the defense maintained that the law was unconstitutional. Uh, then they argued about expert witnesses mm -hmm. and, you know, on and on. So they, they decided, the judge said, no, we're not going to argue constitutionality. We're going to argue guilt or innocence. Mm -hmm. So once that was decided... Uh, the superintendent of schools, chairman of the school board, and two of Scopes's students all testify, were called to testify, all said that 
Scopes had either admitted teaching it or had actually taught it. Mm -hmm. uh, the boys were <laughs> coached a day or two beforehand. Okay. Uh, Scopes, I've, I've heard, either got them together at a house mm -hmm. or drove around town in a taxi, mm -hmm. reviewing ev evolution with them. But <laughs> they, they knew enough evolution to... So they couldn't hurt themselves. They yeah. Hurt themselves. Yeah, well, they were asked, did this all happen on April 21st? But we're not going to talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> Close. Yeah. April 21st, July. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So anyway, they testified, and the state rested. Mm -hmm. uh, the defense called one of their expert witnesses, Dr. Maynard Metcalf, a zoologist, and he began to testify that uh, evolution does not conflict with Scripture, that all scientists believe in evolution, although not all agree on the process, and evolution is a reasonable scientific theory. Well, the defense objected to that, or the, the prosecution objected to that. The judge stopped uh, the proceedings, adjourned for the day, hmm. uh, then went on to uh, produce a ruling that said we weren't going to hear any more experts. Hmm. He allowed the experts to write out affidavits, hmm. submitted them. Well, that kind of knocked the defense in the head. So over the weekend, this, this all took Monday through Friday. Over the weekend, Darrow came up with the idea of questioning William Janicus Bryant. So on Monday, the 20th mm. of July, the defense asked to call Mr. Bryant. Mm. Uh, Bryant agreed to take the stand mm as long as he could question Darrow and the other defense lawyers the next day. What was the pretext for, for calling Brian as, as a witness? I, this, this is, you definitely need a pretext. For this. Yeah, this, this, yeah, this is very unusual well, procedure. <laughs> uh, unheard of, I think, is what one of the <laughs> prosecuting attorneys said. But Brian was being questioned as an authority on the Bible, mm. and... Uh, somewhat familiar with science. They didn't think he was a scientist, but he obviously knew a little something. The defense wanted something, some live testimony. And so Brian, a popular man, somebody the judge obviously respected, uh, seemed like the logical candidate. Mm. So Darrow wound up asking him questions of, uh, Edward Larson at Summer for the Gods describes him as the village skeptic questions. Mm -hmm. Where did Cain get his wife? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, did Joshua make the sun stand still or did the earth stand still? Uh, how many people were on earth 3,000 years ago? Right. Uh, don't you know that the civilizations in China are 5,000, 6,000 years old? And, Stuff like this. We still get asked these questions oh, yeah. today, don't we, John? <laughs> <laughs> and it's always done as a gotcha. Yeah. yeah. It's very long like this. And, and Brian, that's what impressed me about his testimony. That I, I think all of the reporters there just, it just blew right over their heads. He's, mm -hmm. Brian is almost messing with Deb. Uh, he is. He is. He's a master worker. He asks. Darrow asks him, "Do you believe that all the animals died in the flood? Um, that weren't on Noah's ark?" And Bryant's response is, "Yes, except for the fish. <laughs> the fish may have lived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and it's it's uh, it gets interpreted by the press in a very negative light." You know, Darrow had run rampant, but I know you've interviewed people who are there, who have a yeah. very different... Yeah, uh, I think we have to understand, first of all, that Darrow had practiced this yeah. this weekend. Dr. Curtley Mather, head of the geology department at Harvard, 
was a Sunday school teacher. Mm. And we have, we have no record. I want to say that out, out <laughs> at first. We have no record of that practice session. Mm. Mm. But I have to think Dr. Mather answered questions as a scientist and a Christian mm -hmm. would have answered. Mm -hmm. So where did Cain get his wife? Well, he married his sister. Mm. Now, what's the problem with that answer? That's probably right, but I don't know it. I don't have any documentation that I can point to and say, the Bible says this. Mm. Uh. Dare, Brian was not going where the Bible didn't go. Right. So he kept his answers to the Bible says, mm -hmm. the Bible doesn't say, I don't know, I've not thought about that, or this is what I know to be true. Right. And I think Darrow got very frustrated yes. because this is not the way you're supposed to answer. Right. Now, in, in fairness to Darrow, I think Brian got a little frustrated too because you eventually see the two men, and unfortunately I don't have a recording to, to prove this, but I see the two men standing yelling at each other, you know, what's the purpose of this uh, interrogation? To cast ridicule on every believer in the Bible, I'm here to answer all those questions. The purpose is to uh, ensure that bigots and ignoramuses don't control the education of our children. Mm -hmm. I don't think that was said really calmly no. and right. respectfully. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but that's yeah. that's the tension, the intensity that came about as this mm. drew on. And and does the court does does the judge tolerate this, or, or does he draw this to a conclusion at some to, point? <laughs> to, to an extent, he does. But Quindaro says, I'm exempting you, know, you on all your statements that no intelligent Christian on earth believes. Mm. The judge says, that's enough. Mm -hmm. We're adjourned until the morning. Right. The next morning, Darrow probably didn't want to do two things. He probably didn't want to take the stand himself. Mm. And he probably didn't want Brian to... Uh -oh, issue his closing argument. Mm -hmm. uh, so he came into court and asked for a directed verdict of guilty mm -hmm. because he wanted to appeal this. And there were rumors by this time that the jury was kind of upset about not being in to see all this. We're going to acquit mm -hmm. Scopes, which would have messed up Darrow's plans. So the judge... <laughs> you know, allowed the jury to retire. It took them nine minutes. They came back with a guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. uh, he sentenced uh, Scopes to the $100 minimum fine with a court was adjourned. Yeah. Now, I remember the, the, the scene in Inherit the Wind. It's the, it's the scene that particularly stands in my mind, and I'm sure it stands in the minds of lots of other people that at the climax of this trial, um, Brian sort of collapses in the courtroom and dies there and then in the, in the courtroom. That's the scene. That's the scene. <laughs> so That is not reality. Okay, so, so tell us about the reality. Of okay, it. trial ended on Tuesday morning. Mm. And over the next five days, mm. uh, Brian wrote and edited, uh, proofread his uh, closing address. Mm. Uh, he spoke numerous times in the area. Uh, I think on Saturday he went to Winchester where the judge and district attorney were from, spoke over there to several thousand people. Mm. Uh, came back to Chattanooga, was hit by a car, uh, insisted that he was not injured. I mean, you know, was bumps and scrapes, but Paul um, spent the night in Chattanooga, came to Dayton, went to church at First Methodist just down the street from here. Just mm -hmm. down the street. And um, requested mm. the choir to sing a particular hymn, mm. and then went back to the home where he and Mrs. Bride had been staying, ate lunch, made an appointment to go visit the Smoky Mountains National Park, mm. 
lay down, took a nap, had a stroke, and died in his sleep. How old was he? Brian was 65. Okay. Daryl was 68. Okay. And do we know exactly what brought about that stroke? I mean, was it connected to, in some way to the stress of the trial? Was it connected to the accident that he'd had? Okay, you're, I'm going to give you an opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's all we got. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, yeah. Brian was 65 years old. He had a heart condition, evidence of diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, as you look at pictures of him getting off the train in Dayton two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, there's one picture of a man. As you look at pictures of him at the end of the trial, he, he is worn. Yeah. There's no question. It was a it was a stressful yeah. ten days. I too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there one of the songs written about the trial uh, has the line uh, soon after his work was finished he went to his reward. Mm. You know, that's that's as good an explanation as I can and give you. Yeah. Uh, he and Mrs. Bryan talked about, and you, you will read as you study, uh, you will read that Mencken, Darrow, and others uh, said he was a broken man and, you know, his spirit was crushed and, and all of this good stuff. Mrs. Bryan insists that as they were driving around, they were talking about this, and, you know, he was questioning, didn't. Did I accomplish what I wanted to? Are, are, are we going to be able to continue? And Mrs. Bryan said it was a very positive uh, attitude that he exhibited that, you know, okay, let's, let's regroup and let's, let's go on and, and fight this good fight. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't buy the, uh, the trial, the, the disgrace of the trial. Mm -hmm beat him argument i don't buy that which is how the movie kind of oh yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 you gotta think he'd run for president three times mm. lost every time this was you know losing what he wanted yeah it was not he'd done it before he'd done it before yeah so yeah. i can totally understand mrs brian saying yeah he was well beaten positive and thinking about the next thing and yeah how well did this go and what are we going to do next right. of course he's thinking that way because that's how he that's his WJB. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So that kind of brings us into sort of the aftermath of the trial. Uh, what what happens? What's the response to all of, all of this, both here in Dayton and, let's say, nationally? Okay, let, let's start with Dayton. Dayton hoped for an economic bill mm. that didn't happen. Of course... Four years later, we had the stock market crash, the onset of the Great Depression, and it hit Dayton a little harder because Dayton had been working up to that anyway. Right. The, the best thing that happened five years later mm. was the uh, opening of Bryan College, mm. which is still going on today and has, has been a lasting memorial to, to Bryan and to the trial. Yes. Uh, nationally... Almost immediately, you saw textbook authors take the word evolution out of the really text. It was the word. We should express it by that. Yes. Because you can still see concepts in there. They're just right. called evolution. De development, progress. Yes. Yeah. But the word evolution disappeared for what, 20, 30 years, oh, Todd? At least until 1960, the centennial origin of species, mm -hmm. is when it really started coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 59, the, 59 and 60. The Sputnik, the, the space race, and the, let, let's get science education going again and, or going. Yes. Clean it up. <laughs> get it, get it moving. And yeah, that's when evolution came on. Of course, and back to date in the, uh, there, there was no economic boom. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was 40 years or more, 50 years almost, before we got the first big industry mm. that, that came to town. Mm. Uh, 
legally, almost nothing happened. The, the case went to the Tennessee Supreme Court. Mm. Uh, this, the conviction was reversed because the judge had set the fine instead of the jury, which the law required. Oh, that's another interesting story. But uh, so it's kind of a technicality. Yeah, really. very, yeah. very, <laughs> very much yeah. a technicality. Mm -hmm. But they upheld the constitutionality of the law, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. so kind of said, "Don't I, don't ever bring this back to don't us." Do this again. <laughs> <laughs> but the law is constitutional, so uh, which frustrated the defense team mm -hmm. enormously. But sure. in 1968. The U.S. Supreme Court, you might say, finally heard the case, mm -hmm. Epperson versus, versus Arkansas, a law that was passed shortly after uh, the Butler Act, mm -hmm. uh, similar in scope. Mm -hmm. And a biology teacher objected, uh, Susan Epperson, mm -hmm. that went to the Supreme Court, and Justice Abe Fortas, who had been a high school student in Memphis during the trial, uh, remembered what it was like and took the case uh, that was, was assigned the, the case and wrote that creation is a religious doctrine and therefore should not be taught in public schools. Evolution is a scientific doctrine and therefore it can be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a result of Epperson, we've got a series of uh, cases that have essentially held the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, creationists or intelligent design folk have tried various arguments, and well, the, the arguments have not been legally successful. Right. So it's cast a very long shadow uh, oh. in terms of American education and, and sort of legal battles, and, you know, I, I've heard about some of those uh, court cases. It, it's it's a very different situation, a very different context in Britain. So, uh, so, so yeah. But from afar, I've kind of heard about some of these things. And of course, the Dayton, you know, it has today. I mean, still the reverberations are kind oh, yeah. of felt. And and today, it is something that brings tourists and visitors in. And right. we're we're in this fantastic uh, courthouse building and the museum and. We have several thousand people a year mm -hmm. come to visit the museum. Mm -hmm. Every summer we do a dramatization of the trial in the courtroom where it happens. Yeah. Oh, it, it's exciting. People have gotten a little more comfortable, I guess, with, yeah. with the trial here. 40, 50 years ago, you say something about let's, let's celebrate the Scopes trial. I uh -uh, don't want any part of it. Right. And now I think people are beginning to appreciate that, you know, we did something that nobody else did. Mm -hmm. One of the, the things I like to remind people about, uh, as, as far as a summary of what happened, and, you know, you talk about the long shadow. In his closing remarks to the court, Oops. Brian said something to the effect of, Here's been fought out a little case of little consequence as a case, mm. but it raises an issue that someday will be settled right, mm. whether our way or their way. Mm. And I think, yes, he was probably talking about creation evolution. Well, but there were other things going on too. And I think he just, he just said it the best. Yeah. We're still talking about it because we haven't settled those issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Tom. That's been fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, we've really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much for taking the time to meet with us. We'll have to do this again. Get yeah. into more detail because <laughs> yeah. The Scopes trial history is is pretty extensive and there's a lot more <laughs> that we could say. But yeah. this is a great overview, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Every year, the Ray Heritage Preservation Foundation puts on a dramatic reenactment of the Scopes trial in the very courtroom where it took place almost 100 years ago. Unlike Inherit the Wind, this play is based mostly on historic records of the trial and tells the real story of what happened. You can find out more about the play and the work of Ray Heritage at their website, rayheritage.com. Paul and I stopped by the dress rehearsal and then attended the performance on opening night. 
All right. <laughs> Visitor, give us some thoughts on the play here. Now you know the real story or something. It was, it was great. I was so glad we were able to do this. All right. So I've shown you the town. I've shown you the sites. Yep. We talked to Tom Davis, had a really good conversation that with That was Tom. an excellent interview. Yeah, yeah, time, yeah. yeah. I, had a, I had a really good time with that. Yeah. Um, I, took you to the, uh, I took you to the dress rehearsal, <laughs> where you had the great privilege <laughs> yes. of being a part of the actual Scopes uh, play and festivities. Yes. They brought in you a, up on stage. In a non-speaking role. I have yes. To, I, I have to add, and I was horribly miscast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was. He was doing the part of the lad who draws the names for yeah. the jury. That was Tommy Brewer. He was four years old at the time. <laughs> lived across the street from the. Uh... I, I was made for the part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he lived across the street in the courthouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was good. But then we saw the yeah. the actual play. That was nice. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of an odd thing for Dayton to be celebrating. Uh, thing that has been kind of a yeah. black mark on our reputation uh the, the national press sort of tried to make a fool of of dayton mm. every time something mildly weird or strange happens in the mm. town <laughs> everybody in the nation is reminded of how stupid dayton is right. it's very frustrating the national media comes to town with a story mm. already written but it's an important piece of not only the the history of dayton but a piece of national history. Yeah, and a piece of creation history as well. Yeah, it is. And I, I, I think it, you know, it's worthy of being remembered and celebrated and yeah. it, it, it's fun for the town and brings in visitors. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, and I think it teaches us some important lessons. It does, about, yeah. You know, it, it, <laughs> it's probably not a good idea to try to regulate and pass laws and coerce people into thinking a certain way mm -hmm. that generally isn't going to work. Right, and we should, <laughs> and now we're on the other side of history where we're the ones regulated out of the schools. And we should just say, that didn't work for us and it probably isn't going to work for you. Yeah. But that that day of reckoning may be yet in the future. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of trying to put this on trial mm. as if a judge and a jury could actually sort through the evidence and make right. an informed decision. Uh, it, it really does depend, and I know this is a common common claim among creationists, it really does depend a lot on your perspective and mm -hmm. how you begin to approach the evidence, mm -hmm. how you begin to think about weighing the evidence. And yeah. so if you come to it like Clarence Darrow mm -hmm. with his agnosticism, mm -hmm. You're going to read the evidence in one way. You come to it with the faith of William Jennings Bryan, mm -hmm. his confidence in the Bible and the God of the Bible, mm -hmm. and you're going to read it in a very different way. Yeah. And there's a certain political context here as well, which is different, say, in the States than it would be in um, most of Europe. Sure. Great yeah. Britain. Yeah. So, you know, the, this... This is why some of this seems so unfamiliar to someone like me, because it's a it's a kind of political context that we're not very yeah. familiar with. You don't have that. You don't have that separation no. of church and state. No, we don't have separation you have of church, a church and state. A state. We church. have an established yeah. church. Yeah. And so Christianity um, has always played a role in education in Britain. Right. Uh, now things are changing. Yes, we, of we, course. We live in a we yes. live in different times. Yeah. Um, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a different kind of context. Yeah, yeah. And I think creation would be as unwelcome in our state schools as as it is here. Um, but, you know, that's well, how it is these days. They tried to pass some kind of weird law recently about how creation is a, a religious doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It all struck me as very Orwellian mind control kind of legislation, which is doomed to fail. <laughs> but having said all that, I guess that's... Yeah. Wraps up this episode. Yep. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and we will catch you again later. Yep. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes and all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science, 
and in the UK by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.